As J-Mac well knows, I don't generally like sports movies, but I love sports books. Jeff Benedict, sitting alongside us now, is a New York Times bestselling author uh, of 16 books, TV and film producer, executive producer on the HBO documentary Tiger, who, who we wrote with uh, our friend Arvin Katayan. He's got a new book out, LeBron. Um, I just finished it up. There's so um, much depth and reporting here. So let's start with this. Let's go back. Um, you really get a sense of now Tiger was combative when you tried to do the book. Brady was over the top willing to. LeBron's takeaway on you writing a book, you know, when you go a, a mile deep on somebody, what's been the reaction? I'm certainly not antagonistic at all. I mean, none of these players at this level have any, they don't owe any journalist anything in terms right. of access or cooperation. And I didn't, I never go in expecting um, a player to participate. Um, for a biography of a living person, that's typically doesn't happen. Um, but LeBron didn't do anything to obstruct the process, to make it difficult. I mean, it was, from my perspective, it was a pleasure to research and write. So the Air movie just came out. Much of that is the story of Michael Jordan and the shoe deal. So LeBron signs a shoe deal early. His idol was Michael Jordan. Uh, the losers on that were Adidas and Reebok. So we we get a, we got a really behind the scenes look in the Air movie at at the pitch by a converse to Michael Jordan's mother uh, and the losers in that. So let's go. What did LeBron do? He chooses Nike. The losers are Reebok and Adidas. What did he say to them? So here's the thing, Colin. That's so great. I love the Air movie, but what's so different in LeBron's case is Sonny Vaccaro did not have a relationship with Michael Jordan uh, before signing him. He built an incredible relationship with LeBron James and Gloria James that started way before LeBron decided to go with Nike. Um, I think the Sonny Vaccaro story with LeBron is, it's an incredible epic American story about, about how they met. I mean, Basically, Sonny had guys that were almost like runners that were they were little scouts who were finding high school kids <laughs> right. because they're funneling them to what was then the, the greatest basketball camp in the country. Sonny's ABCD camp. Yeah. And when LeBron was a freshman, like that year after LeBron's freshman year, one of Sonny's guys, you know, they meet at the final four and he brings a VHS tape like a video cassette to show Sonny this kid that he's found in Akron named LeBron James. And so all the guys in the suite are standing around the TV watching this videotape, and Sonny comes in and, and sees these guys. He's like, what are you guys looking at? And they go, you know, one of the guys says, this kid, you know, LeBron James, he's going to be like the next Jason Kidd or whatever. And Sonny's like, yeah, right. You know, he comes over. He's squinting and looking at the guy, looking at LeBron, and finally he's like, he can't see anything. He looks like a peanut. And it's just because it was shot so poorly, you know? And they're like, you got to invite him to your camp. And Sonny's like, I can't invite him to my camp. He's a ninth grader. He's a freshman. Within two years, LeBron gets basically what amounts to a private audition in the Bay Area. He flies out there to play in front of Sonny because Sonny wouldn't go to Akron. Sonny comes into the gym. They met beforehand in like the hotel cafe. Yeah. It's a great meeting. When LeBron and Gloria meet Sonny and Pam Vaccaro, there's an instant connection. They get along right away, and then that day he plays in front of Sonny. And partway through the game, Sonny just walks out of the gym, doesn't say anything. People are thinking, oh, no, this is a disaster. He gets in a cab, hails it to the airport, and partway there his wife is asking him, like, why aren't you talking, saying anything? And Sonny says, I... I've never seen a player like that. I mean, that's a huge statement from the guy who signed Michael Jordan and then signed Kobe Bryant to major sneaker deals. It sets up this great fight between the big three sneaker companies, which Nike ultimately wins. And I love it when Sonny, knowing he's going to lose, tells LeBron, get as much money as you can. <laughs> It's just, it's great stuff. Let's go to LeBron's idol, Michael Jordan, the first time they meet. Where is it? So uh, LeBron, it's off season. LeBron's just finished his sophomore year of high school. He's playing in an AAU tournament in Chicago. He's got yeah. Maverick Carter with him. Yeah. And one of Michael's guys, keep in mind, Michael's in retirement at this point. He's not in the NBA. Right. 
one of Michael's guys approaches Maverick and LeBron during the AAU tournament, like in between games, and invites them to basically take a ride and go to see Michael's private gym, Hoops, in Chicago. Yeah. They go. They see it. It's, you know, it's, it's cool to go in. They see the weights that Michael uses. And the guy says to them, you guys should come back later this summer. Stay at my place. LeBron can work out of the gym for a few days. They have to ask their moms to get permission to go, which is telling a little bit about the character of LeBron and Maverick. Yeah. What they were like is they're kids. Yeah. And their moms are in their lives. Sure. This is a big deal. Their moms give them permission. They go back. And later that summer... And they work out, and, and LeBron does. At one, that chapter is called A Different Floor because at one point LeBron is invited to get on the floor mm -hmm. with players in the NBA, Jerry Stackhouse, Antoine Walker. These guys are big, long. Men. They're men. And when LeBron gets on the floor, it looks smaller, even though dimensionally it's not. And he plays that. He can't stop anybody on defense, but he can score. And the players all see that this a sophomore, a sophomore can score against them. And he's a good passer. At the end of that day, they all leave and go home. LeBron being LeBron stays behind, cleans up the gym with the guy. They're leaving to go home. The next day, LeBron has to be in high school for his first day of his junior year. As he and Maverick are leaving, Michael pulls up in the red sports car and gets out. And it's the moment. It's like... The kid meets the idol. The idol meets the future. And Michael invites him back inside. He doesn't give LeBron any advice, but he gives him his cell phone number. And to me, it's like this is the moment where the future and the past. Michael doesn't give out his phone number. But he gives it to LeBron. And the next day, LeBron is his first day of his junior year of high school. Think about that. He goes to school with that number in his pocket. Why this is fascinating is because if you fast forward about five, six months, LeBron is going to meet Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated in the locker room at the high school. He doesn't know Grant Wall. Never seen him, never met him. Grant's not a big name yet at SI. He's got like 15 seconds to go up to LeBron, total stranger, and pitch him on cooperating with him on a feature story. He wants to profile him in the magazine. And I interviewed Grant about this. It's a wonderful story. He didn't know how to do it. And he finally just, he knew that LeBron and Maverick and another friend were going to Cleveland that night to watch Michael, who's now on the Wizards because he's come out of retirement, play the Cavaliers. He knows they have tickets and they're going. So he asks LeBron, would you let me drive you and your friends to the game? And LeBron's got to decide whether to get in the car with this stranger. That chapter's called Get in the Car. Mm -hmm. And he, without calling his mom, without calling the coach over, he has no adult that he turns to for advice. Within 30 seconds, he decides to trust Grant enough to get in his car. Mm -hmm. And they drive to Cleveland. And they get there, and that night, by now, six months after that initial meeting at Hoops Dream, Jim, Michael and LeBron have a relationship that's very different. It's more mature. Like when Michael comes up to LeBron after the game in the tunnel, he says to him, you know, where's your mom? How's she doing? He knows the family by now. The reason I think, and Grant Wall's jaw is just dropping. Like right. he's, this kid is a junior in high school right now, and he's carrying on with Michael Jordan like he knows him because he does. Yeah. And I think it's phenomenal because they're now going to call him the chosen one, the heir to Air Jordan yeah. in the magazine, it all started in a small private gym in Chicago. Um, there's been a couple of low points for LeBron. One, I think, is a little overstated, the decision, which they did give millions of dollars to a boys and girls club, but be that as it may, it was clumsy. Uh, by the way, that's the first chapter of his book, Jeff Benedict's book. It's a fascinating chapter. You get details you'll not get anywhere else. I mean, just just read chapter one, and that's the hook. You'll be <laughs> you'll be hooked. You'll read the rest of the book. Uh, but I, what I want to go to is when LeBron left Cleveland. Uh, they're burning their you know their their the decision. They're burning jerseys. So he goes to uh, Miami. Dan Gilbert pens a really incendiary letter, which Dan Gilbert later regrets. It's all emotion. It's juvenile for a billionaire. But I want to get past Miami. LeBron is willing and capable 
of putting it all aside four years later when Dan Gilbert comes, a mea culpa, to meet LeBron to get him back to Cleveland. I always thought that was remarkable. I don't know if I could have done a bygone to be bygones. I'm not a grudge holder, but that go back and read that letter. It's almost remarkable it went public. Um, take me to that decision by LeBron to meet him and then choose to go back home. So a couple things. First of all, that's um, a screed that wasn't written with a pen. It was written with a blowtorch. I mean, he, he burned every bridge that LeBron had to Cleveland mm -hmm. when he wrote and said those things. And then to compound it, later that night, he actually then talked to a reporter from the Associated Press and went even further than what he said in his letter. So by the time LeBron lands in Miami at 2 or 3 in the morning, he knows everything that, that Gilbert has said about him. I interviewed a number of NBA executives who are still in the league today, so they didn't want to be named or quoted in the book. But what the consensus was, they were shocked, not so much that Gilbert felt the way he felt, but that he actually voiced it. I couldn't believe it. it, it that was the stunning thing because – LeBron still had so long to go in his career. Like, he's so – he's 25 and at that point. And stayed in the East. Yes. He's going to have to go through LeBron. It, it was just remarkable. And then four years later, when LeBron decides to go back, by now, his inner circle, Maverick, Rich Paul, these guys are a lot more sophisticated and grown up than they were even just four years earlier. They've learned a lot. Rich Paul – does an incredible job here that he doesn't really get any credit for, but he was a navigator in this situation. Um, and to LeBron's credit, everyone around him doesn't want him to go back to Cleveland, and they don't really understand why he's willing to go back. Maverick wasn't excited about it. And LeBron is – this is where I think you see the, the LeBron that's now a fully formed man – and I don't, I don't, I mean that in, in multiple ways. Yes, as a player, but also as an adult, as a businessman, as a person who's capable of looking at the long game and the long haul, yeah. which so few athletes yeah. really are able to do in the moment. Yeah. LeBron has always had a long term view of his career and the decisions he makes. The investment decisions he made with Warren Buffett's guidance in the beginning were long picture decisions and he does it here. And when he agrees to pen an essay with Lee Jenkins from sports illustrated yep. that says, who am I to hold a grudge? That single sentence, you almost don't need to read the rest of that essay, <laughs> even though it's a fantastic essay, well penned, well thought out. But that single sentence that LeBron put his name to is you just go, okay, the, the level of maturity that you're seeing here is just different. There isn't maturity like it in the NBA. Think about Pat Riley, who, who's finding out through a phone call that LeBron's not coming back. Riley's furious. I mean, he, this isn't good news. It's like we were going to win a lot more championships. They were primed to do it. They were built to do it. Riley would have spent even more money to get more role players. They could have just kept rolling. And it didn't make sense to, to Riley or anybody else why LeBron was doing this. He obviously wasn't motivated in that moment to catch Michael. He was driven by something else. Because if he just wanted to catch Michael and get six rings, we'll just stay in Miami. That's right. That's the easy path. Yes. It's all there. You're, go you're talking about going back to Cleveland, a team that stinks. Yes. I'm not saying they were kind of good. They stunk. Yeah. This is not a good team. Yeah, Kyrie Irving was viewed as a bust. They, they, Couldn't stay healthy. Yeah, he's going back there. But here was the difference. Now that he's won in Miami, this is like Tom Brady in 2007. After he's won three Super Bowls, why does Randy Moss go to New England? He goes to play with Tom. And LeBron does know when he goes to Cleveland, there's guys like Kevin Love who would never go to Cleveland, but he'd go to play with LeBron. He is a magnet for talent. He can get guys to go there, and he can take a guy like Kyrie Irving, and he can now be the statesman, the teacher, the guy with the young stars under right. his wing. 
And he does all those things. Yeah, I've always found it remarkable that if you're in the public spotlight, you could be a politician, you could be a talk show host, you could be a basketball player, um, you're going to step in it. Uh, <laughs> you know, LeBron, you know, I, I, I didn't take much of it. His comments on China, you know, for conservatives, that's just, you know, red meat. They're going to go after that. <laughs> but by and large, uh, if you look at LeBron's childhood, uh, he has been, it's, it's really a remarkable American story that um, it's almost like uh, LeBron didn't have the cohesive family, so he is so loyal to it. Um, our, our, what is it about his personality that he doesn't seem, um, there's no FOMO, there's no fear of missing out with him. It's, I mean, it's, it's kind of unique, right? I think so, and when, you know, when I was when I was crafting the early chapters of the narrative, not not later when he's in the NBA, but the, right. my favorite part of the whole book is the origin story. It's the, it's writing the origin story because I kept trying to think of a comparison, a, fi a sports figure. Who who do I compare him to? And I couldn't come up with anybody. the The person I thought of the most was actually Alexander Hamilton, you know, an orphan, an immigrant, yeah. who comes to America. And ends up being George Washington's right hand man. Like that is so, sounds so fictional, so made up, so unbelievable. But that's how LeBron's origin story is. I'm not suggesting that being the greatest basketball player in the world is on par with being a founding father. I'm not right. saying that. Right. I'm saying that if you look at the odds of LeBron James becoming one of the most respected, successful, known humans on earth, if you start where he started, that doesn't happen. And to maintain it with very few missteps, virtually impossible. Yeah, virtually impossible. And I, th the worst thing that people say about him is the way, not that he went to Miami, but the way he announced That's it. That's right. But, you know, the benefit of time, if you step back from that, it's now yes. been 13 years. As a biographer, I look at that as, actually, <laughs> there was a lot of smart things that happened there. This is where he crosses over and really becomes interesting to the whole world. Prior to that, he was a great basketball player that everyone who follows basketball was interested in. After that, the whole world was interested in this guy. Also, after that, people started taking sides. Yes. Pro or anti-LeBron. And I've said this before. Uh, you know, we romanticize JFK or Reagan. How would they have dealt with social media? Everybody great is now polarizing. Yes. There is no non-polarizing stars. It doesn't exist anymore. No, it, but LeBron, LeBron made a decision, a conscious decision that Michael never made and Kobe didn't make, which is he decided to step into the political arena. Yeah. And to me, this is... Again, as a biographer, a lot more interesting than basketball is that for the first seven years of his career as a Cavalier, he was actually a lot like Michael in the sense that he did not step over the line right. into the political sphere. Basketball and shoes and fam. Yeah, yeah he, he stayed in the safe space when he went to the Beijing Olympics and he was under tremendous scrutiny. Steven Spielberg and LeBron James were the two targets of the political activism campaigns to yeah. get them to speak out against China. Spielberg eventually stepped away. He was supposed to choreograph the opening ceremonies. The pressure got too much. He left. LeBron didn't leave. And then he got to Beijing and he wouldn't speak out. Fast forward just a couple months. Barack Obama's running for president. It's the fall of 2008. And Jay-Z is doing three benefit concerts for Barack Obama. And the last one's in Cleveland. And LeBron decides to come and he gets up on stage at the queue, a full house. And he tells everybody how important it is. Uncles, aunts, moms, you got to vote. And he tells the arena who he's voting for, Barack Obama. And he also made a political contribution to his campaign. First time he'd ever done those things. And once Obama's in the White House for eight years, LeBron is visiting the White House, not just when they win championships, he builds a relationship with Barack Obama. He learns from him from modeling. And during those eight years, you see LeBron really grow fast in being able to deal with things like 
gun violence, racism. Mm -hmm. he, he is taking steps that are so affirmative that by the time Donald Trump comes around in 2016, he is a completely different person, way more. He, he's just so smart about how to deal with things. So when Trump is caught on tape saying these incredibly hideous things about women and how he treats them and what he gets away with, but things I can't even repeat on the air. Right. And that tape gets released right before his debate with Hillary Clinton. And Trump tries to dismiss it by saying, oh, that's just locker room talk. Yeah. That was his quote, locker room talk. LeBron is now the most visible athlete in the world. And he comes right out and says to the press, I have a mother-in-law. I have a wife. I have a mother. I have a daughter. We don't talk that way in the locker room. He never mentions his name. That, to me, was one of the most powerful statements. And if you need any evidence that this guy had the potential to go into politics and be a leader, it was right then. Yeah. You just knew if Trump gets elected, there's going to be a collision. Yeah. And, and by the way, it, he made a personal pivot. You, nothing would have seemed less likely than LeBron being front and center of politics seven years earlier. No. So uh, great stuff. Jeff Benedict, New York Times bestselling author. The new book is LeBron covering his life, childhood in Akron to becoming the NBA's all time leading scorer. What a pleasure this has been. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.